Howdy, 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 my name is Zanachi Sasuke, and welcome back to Let's Read Prequel, or Making a Cat Cry the Adventure. In the last episode, Sigrid is insane. So insane. But now, Kati is going to tell a story. Let's see now, what's the story? You take a deep breath and clear your mind. Every good story needs a dramatic pause after the title drop. You take the moment to assess the situation. Also, clothing? I wear that sometimes. Looks like there's prequel shirts now. Interesting. And also, boop. Quarg wrote, Wait, can you see that magic of stuff while blinded? If so, that might not be as debilitating as we thought, as you should at least be able to work out where some things are if you pay attention. You already used your telekinesis a few times while the cloak was recharging, so you know blindness doesn't inhibit your ability to... Well, it's not really the same thing as seeing, it's more like sensing the implication of something. Like how you can tell people have a skeleton inside them even though you only see it through how they move. You doubt that you could have noticed this magical aspect of things while blind, but now that you know it's there, it's easy enough to discern. It's like listening for your name in a noisy room. Magically speaking, your own presence is loud and clear, linked with what you assume is the Cloak of Grey Tomorrow. The stone platform, the pillar, and a couple of the cage bars are vaguely readable, but without your eyesight as a guide, it's trickier to get a sense of exactly where they are relative to you. Sigrid's little Daedra stands out much more than they do, and you can sense a strand of magicka connecting him to... Oh, gods, your eyes! Out of force of habit, you toggle your dark vision, which you're pretty sure makes it... just makes the illusory light even brighter? You hope eye blood doesn't somehow... Uh, doesn't show through your mask. Luckily, you manage to coolly segue into your pain... You segue your pain fluently into a dramatic glance over your shoulder. At least, you're choosing to believe it looked cool. Anyway, you tell Sigrid, let me tell you the story of the littlest dog. Harmony wrote, In order to improvise a story, you need what are called hunting grounds, so you don't run out of ideas. They're kind of like a theme that you turn to when you need to think of what comes next. Rusty F wrote, Use littlest dog as allegory for your own history and life story. Rusty F also wrote, Once upon a time in Hammerfell, Harmony wrote, The littlest dog's name is Pokey. Trash Panda wrote, you need to really stretch this out, so describe the dog the best you can. Gage wrote, It's less suspicious if you be specific. The littlest dog is now a sword dog. Shishimi wrote, And even though he was the smallest dog in the village, he was befriended by the largest cat who accompanied him everywhere. Mega Magic Monkey wrote, The littlest dog was your best only friend growing up. You loved him, and he was sweet, until, well, that happened. Literacy Coupling wrote, so the littlest doggy was a scared little dog who ended up on a ship fleeing their homeland after some very embarrassing events the little dog would never want to talk about. They ended up in a new land thinking today is the start of a new you, etc. The littlest corgi wrote, The littlest dog whose name was Lulu came to Imperial City from Hammerfell! Once upon a time in Hammerfell, there was a very small dog. He was a golden retriever named Pokey, coppery beige in color with droopy ears, bouncy fur, and a thick leather collar. Through happenstance, we came to meet one day when I was little. Nobody knew who owned him, but we quickly became the best of friends. Honestly, the littlest dog was my only friend growing up. I taught him how to fetch sticks, how to dig holes, and I would strap toy swords all over him so we could go on adventures. We were inseparable. As time went on though, the littlest dog started getting into trouble more and more often. Even though he was always ashamed when reprimanded, he just wasn't good at being a good dog. One day he just decided to leave Hammerfell. According to some people, he started responding to the name Lulu instead and wandered off towards the heartland. Huh. You're, you're already starting to struggle with the story a little. Maybe try to base it off your own life wasn't such a good idea. When you cut out all the sex and alcohol, your life story is pretty much you were in Hammerfell and then now you were here? You gotta plan this distraction out better. Dawn Feathers wrote, Request some refreshments. TM Cool wrote, Ask for a drink since you're, pro you're get pretty parched. It'll also stall for time so you can think of the story and see again. You pause and explain to Sigurd that telling a story this long is a lot of work, especially after you've been running around town all night. Your throat is kind of parched. There's a barrel of water right there, Sigrid says. She asks if you have any objections to using an alchemical mortar as a cup. Water's a little plain, you say. What you're really in the mood for is some coffee. Like, not black coffee? Something with a lot of cream and sugar if she has that upstairs. Maybe she then could maybe go get it? Sigrid says you're kind of milking this request, also possibly trying to get rid of her. No, you explain. You just... Need very specific things in order to tell this very important story adequately, but fine. If she's not going to get you what you need, you'll just stand here in silence and swallow saliva for two minutes until you're not thirsty anymore? You tell her she brought this upon herself. Apparently, Alvin wrote, 
You've demonstrated your ability to move existing properties around, such as the gravity of various objects, allowing you to move them with telekinesis. Can you create from scratch, cat pun not intended, properties that you're observed with your witch hunter vision? Try recreating the properties you see on Tumble Spider. Perhaps if you can copy the one dictating that Tumble Spider is a monster summoned into this world, you'll summon your own. If that kind of magic is possible, you suspect it's way over your level. The properties you see on things aren't concrete entities, they disappear and reappear from moment to moment, and they never look quite the same twice. Trying to build something like that out of rudimentary magicka pushing would probably be like trying to build a living creature out of food. The best you'd get is one of those animal shaped chicken nuggets they give to kids. On top of that, you still haven't been able to modify the properties of anything alive. It's just like silver. Even when you tried to levitate yourself, the most you could do was lift up your clothing. If you're trying to directly alter the properties of something, you'd probably have better luck messing with one of the cage bars. There were a few symbols that seemed like they might represent tangibility. Looking into them could be a start. Reader Boy wrote, I have an idea of how to break beak through the cage. Ice magic. Essentially, if you freeze metal bars, then reheat it again, freeze again, and so on, the temperature fluctuations should make them shatter. Then you can use your Khajiit claws on the witch. She's clearly expecting you to attack her with magic, not melee. Or... Destruction magic, on the other hand, might be a simpler solution? None of your earlier experiments with the conjuring ice and lightning worked out, but if you could find the trigger for frost magic, it probably wouldn't be hard to weaken and kick out a bar. Plus, depending on how the bar breaks, you might be left with a viable weapon. Hopefully not in your leg. Of course, Sigurd would be, ha have ample warning of what's happening if she saw you heating and cooling a bar. Plus, destruction spells eat through your magic reserve dangerously fast, and you have no idea how much you have left. Plus... Fighting someone in hand-to-hand -hand combat isn't going to be easy when all you can see is the general direction they are standing. Running away on foot isn't an option either, at least not until your sight comes back. It was hard enough making it down that twisty path when you could see. Lejosu wrote, Remember how that weird ghost dude said that the really dangerous people dig with spoons? I think we got one here. She's a real spoon digger, but you? You're not like her, you're smarter. And it's time to build a shovel. Focus on the magic around you. Feel it flow. How it moves, what it does. You don't need eyes. You can see what gives everything its properties, what makes everything what it is. Remember, you lifted a peg with an amulet of silence on. You aren't wearing that anymore. You can do far more than lift objects and move them with your eyes. Not only can you alter the laws of the things around you, your unicorns, which is to say your magic, can now leave your body with a rider. There's no bridge blocking its path. Take that energy, guide it out of your body, ride your magic outside of the cage and out of the cave you're in. Take it through the trapdoor and into the room you came from. Make a tunnel out of magic to, to out of here and somewhere safe. Now, take each of the attributes that make you who you are, your senses, your body, your mind. Steadily push them through the tunnel until they reach the other side. Do not lose yourself. Feel yourself sliding through the magical passage you created. Making your way to the other side should be as simple as climbing out of a bedroll. Congratulations, mannequin. You can teleport. Wow! Okay, that sounds like a solution you can work with. You concentrate on your own energy, carefully guiding a strand of it out of the cage through the ambient magicka and towards the basement door. Almost immediately, however, you run into a problem. Once you get more than a few feet from your body, the ambient magicka fades into a black abyss. Sigrid still stands out like a sore thumb, and you could sense the tumble spider up until it stepped away from the cage, but without your sight, it's surprisingly hard to focus on an inanimate object you can't reach. You're guessing it must be a factor of magical power. Sigrid and her enchantments are very strong, so you can pinpoint her all the way on the other side of the die. The Tumble Spider is likely just an animal from another plane, so a short distance is all it needs to escape your detection, but things like the basement door are completely undetectable, as are the people up on the surface, even though some of the priests in town had considerable magic skills. As you reach further, though, you start to notice something unnerving. There are things you can detect even further away. The page is getting darker as it goes. Katia Reach. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Hmm. What is, what is she detecting right now? The cosmos? K K Katia? Miss Mannigan? I hate to think you were ignoring me, Katia, especially... Sammy955 wrote, Don't forget about the story as you investigate. You don't want Sigurd to get suspicious. Ah, right, the story. I'm here! I'm, I'm here, you say, shaking confusing images from your head. Sorry, I just got... Where did I leave off again? So you're gonna explain that you were telling a story about a dog named Lulu claiming it to be important. Right, you say. You're gonna keep telling that now. You're a little dizzy. 
You hear footsteps and an ominous shuffling sound, like Sigrid is adjusting her clothes or pulling something out of them. Without your sight, though, you can't tell exactly what she's doing. Slug filler wrote, The littlest dog thought to become a good dog in this new place, but everyone just saw him as a stray. Being turned away left and right, before long he ended up getting into the same sort of trouble as in Hammerfell. However, one day that trouble led him to a little girl. Unlike everyone else, the little girl was willing to try and play with him. First she tried to play fetch. She threw a stick, but all the way to get the stick, he saw a nice juicy steak on the side of the road. Distracted, he went towards the steak and accidentally stepped on the stick and broke it. At least I can still bring back the steak, he thought, but as he turned to look at the stick he broke, a bird came down and took the steak. All right, no steak and no stick, but he still decided to bring back the broken stick to the girl, and amazingly enough, the girl was willing to give him one more chance. <clears throat> She would throw him another stick, a bigger, sturdier stick, but this time, she would throw it very far, and if he can bring it back this time, she'll take him as her dog. Clearing your throat, you delve back into the distraction. Anyway, the little dog wanted to become a good dog, so he went to a faraway place to get away from his bad habits, but since everyone in the distant land just saw him as a stray dog, he got into the same type of trouble all over again, until one day, he ran across a little girl who was willing to play with him a little. First, she tried to play fetch with him, but he got distracted by a freshly cooked steak that was on the side of the road. Only when he started for the steak, he stepped on the stick and ruined it, and then birds ate it. The steak, I mean, not the stick. The, uh, MWK wrote, You want to stall for time, right? In that case, you need to talk slowly, but not too slowly to be suspicious. It's hard! You talk fast when you're nervous. Still talking too fast, you tell Sigrid that the story is actually quite complex, which is why it's so hard to remember all the important pieces when telling it on the spot. It's a well of class to back where you grew up, though, and the more educated scholars of the land can easily tend to spend 10 minutes analyzing the subtleties and meanings of the symbolism of the first part alone. I thought it was a personal story, Sigrid said. You were literally a character in it. You were a character in it, you explained. The story is just told from the first person perspective. It's part of the symbolism. But you can understand if she missed it. You did it first, too. Only the smartest people can listen to half the story and then spend 10 minutes picking out the deep meaning in it. Katia, she asks, she asks, are you clumsily asking me to analyze your story back to you? No, you quickly say, you're just expressing that she probably can't spend as long doing it as the really smart people can. Sigrid sighs and says, the story isn't that complicated. First of all, you're from Hammerfell, so the idea of escaping past predilections by relocating is obvious. Secondly, the words with, the words, 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 with all the rumors that have words, 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 words about a kind of words, words, comma, wrote, take inventory. Tree Shaker wrote, have a, have a timer with to when you can see again. With Sigrid temporarily preoccupied, you quickly check the countdown timer on your blindness, 43 minutes, 41 minutes remaining, and open your inventory. A vast majority of your equipment is completely useless for escaping an evil sorceress while blind. You have several keys to doors you've already gone through, six magic books you briefly flipped through but now cannot read, a book for blind alchemists you could read but have already read, and a lockpick with nothing to unlock. As far as magical items go, you're in possession of one possibly filled soul gem and one cursed invisibility cloak that currently has a blindness spell on you. Alchemically speaking, you have a cotton bandage you might be able to eat as a very temporary magic resistance potion, and a scrap of bread you might be able to siphon a very temporary vision spell out of. As a mag naturally magic resistant person who can see magic, these are not very useful potions to have. You also have a neck gaiter currently pulled up over your face and two sheets of no mostly used paper. Luwek G wrote, Try to remove property on the cloak of grey tomorrow that makes you blind. Van Van Anon wrote, Wait, hold on. That property. Whenever you examine yourself, is, is that... Is that unluckiness? While you can definitely see the magical circuit that is keeping you blinded, any effort to change it is like prying a steel bar with your bare hands. You still aren't completely sure how this stuff works, or if you're confusing blue squigglies or even an accurate visual visualization of it, but whatever force keeps you from altering the magic of living things seems to be protecting the blindness spell as well. As for that other symbol you keep seeing, you doubt it's unluckiness since you've noticed it even on inanimate things. From the looks of it, you're guessing it has to do with wilting? Or decay? This is probably what wizards mess with to extend their lifespan. At any time but now, the secret to immortality would have been a pretty cool discovery. Commodore Sleepy wrote, Okay, this might sound like a dumb idea, but what is it you can see out way out there, and which direction is it? You're no scientist, but you're pretty sure you're sensing stars. Lots and lots and lots of faraway stars swirling all over. Even though the star's magic was apparently strong enough to sense all the way from this cage, they didn't seem to have any of the usual blue squigglies and circles. It was more like they were just beacons of pure magic. Or at least you're assuming that's what it means when something comes across as plain as a white dot. As a plain white dot. 
You're making a lot of guesses and assumptions here based on a very vague understanding of sorcery. The philosopher wrote, Is it possible for you to reach out to things that you're sensing? Maybe bring them here so Sigrid has something to deal with. While, again, you're not an expert, you're pretty sure people can't just pull stars out of the sky. If they could, you're 100% certain all of the stars will be gone by now and probably owned by Khajiit. But, now that you think about it, there is magic that involves pulling creatures and tools from other worlds. It can't be too complicated either. You've seen Sigrid casually summon weird animals several times now, and to your knowledge, she's no summoning expert. If your magic can sense the stars all the way out at the edges of Oblivion, maybe it's fully within your power to reach out to something near them. Of course, even if you manage to reach out among the stars and find a weapon or something, you aren't sure about how to get it from there to here. Maybe that part comes naturally after you reach something? Or if it doesn't, maybe you can still relay a message to the outside. Or maybe your careless tampering with otherworldly forces will accidentally summon a fiery hell demon that wants to kill everyone. That seems to happen a lot in a lot of cautionary tales about tampering with otherworldly forces, but like, as long as the demon ends up on the other side of the cage bars, you're pretty sure that would still be a win. As far as you can hear, the cave is empty other than Sigurd's voice and an occasional rustling you assume is the tumble spider. A little over a minute has passed since she started talking about how the story is just a thin metaphor for your life, and you aren't sure how much longer this cheap trick is going to buy you. Doing your best to think of, think magic thoughts and sense the magic energy, you once again reach out as far as you can. It's getting dark again. About half of the code stuff, other half of the code stuff, the swirly thing, the original swirly thing before Photoshop crashed, destroyed it, she got sick before she could remake it. Confront barrier. Creepy bot ink wrote, wait, there's some kind of giant ring around you. I think that might be a barrier separating you from any other world, so the... The idea of getting anything from an other, any other world is a bust. That's a long beam. Let's find out! That is a really long beam. Oh, wow. It's still going. MTV Catfish wrote, Is it normal to be able to feel the stars? Is it in any of your books? Code Spark wrote, Reach for the brightest one. It might be close enough for you to reach. Among the stars wrote, Wait a second, our star is made of magic or something. If so, you might be able to siphon a bit of magic from them somehow. Worth a shot anyway. You've always heard there are holes in the night sky to Aetherius? Though, these definitely seem more like ball. More ball-like than hole-like. And while it sounds good in theory, vigorously groping the ball with your magic a squiggle apparently doesn't siphon power out of it. Three wrote, The reason you couldn't teleport out of the cage was that you didn't sense anything outside to attach your magic to, right? Well, now you do. Might be worth a shot. You try out your teleportation idea from earlier, imagining a tunnel along the Magicka Strand and yourself moving along it. You imagine as hard as you can, but nothing seems to happen. Either teleportation is more complicated than you assumed, or some subconscious part of you doesn't want to teleport up into the sky. Another minute has passed. Sigurd is still talking, for now. Slightly concerned wrote, or er, slightly concerned wrote, TOUCH EVERYTHING IN THE BIG NOTHING! What's the reason wrote, don't, don't, don't pick one that feels evil or one that feels good. Evil would try to disguise itself as a good one. Pick the one that feels neutral. Squiggly, squig, squiggle, squig, squiggle, squiggle, squig, squiggle. And that looks like where you started. You must have gotten turned around somewhere. That or space loops at the edges. You're pretty sure at least another minute has passed. Maybe two. You're losing track. Squiggly squig squiggle. Apparently Avon wrote, Conjuration is not about might or solving riddles or agonizing over busty old scrolls. It's about fostering relations. Being friendly, you might say. You have to reach out to the spirits or the danger and convince them that being here is better than being where they currently are. That protecting you is a worthwhile commitment. You'd like to foster some relations. That was the whole idea. The issue is that there's just nothing out here. While it's surprisingly easy to reach your little magic line up into the sky, all you found are scattered balls of light. Maybe otherworldly forces just really don't want to help you. Or maybe beckoning help from otherworldly forces just completely outside the abilities of a stupid country pumpkin who started magic two days ago. Like, it, w it wouldn't exactly be the first time you've grossly overestimated your capabilities. It wouldn't be the first time in the last five minutes. What with your plan to magically teleport out of here? That itch wrote, you know how you can't see two drawings on two sheets of paper at the same time when they're laid on top of each other? Unless you put them against the light source, try to imagine space around you as a layer and see if there may be other layers with something that might have something summonable. Or, maybe you're not looking in the right spot. You've been weaving your little magic line around in the distance as though you're going to find another world far, far away. 
A summoning creature from other planes with some kind of very long range teleport though, then every summoner would have to be an expert at teleportation, and like, you've seen secret walk places? If you could teleport, you would never ever walk, but maybe it's not a distance thing, but another sheet of paper. If you were actually going to invoke some kind of otherworldly help, maybe you'd have to look in some kind of weird fuckways direction. Which of course puts you back at square one, and to make matters worse you hear a finality in Sigrid's tone that implies she's nearing the end of her long-winded explanation. Without the slightest lead, your plan to come up with a plan isn't exactly going great right now. Okay. Everything's still sky purple. Saros Infinity wrote, By assuming the possibility of another layer of paper, it means you sort of know that there's got to be something hidden you're not sensing. Though that certain something might be beyond your reach. Unless you think like a witch hunter, left, right, up, down, psh, two-dimensional. Try going inwards or outwards instead. Yeah, that, that that's just called moving in three dimensions. It's not exactly a witch hunter accomplishment. Witch hunter tier accomplishment. You're, you've actually been doing a lot of it out here. You just don't have a second mind's eye for depth perception. The entire point of separate sheet of paper analogy was that each sheet represented a whole three-dimensional universe. If you're right, it doesn't matter how far inward, outward, up, down, left, or right you reach your little magical line. You'd never reach across into the next sheet because it's not in any of those directions. Rather than literally being on top of each other like a stack of paper, the planes people summon help from would be lined up in some fourth dimension. And unlike a needle poking through papers, you can't imagine what something reaching perpendicularly through multiple universes would even look like. Valerius wrote, You said there's supposed to be holes in the Aetherius, right? If we're traveling on a flat sheet in two dimensions, and falling through a hole carries us to a third, a dimension perpendicular to the sheet, wouldn't falling through a ball or third dimension hole send us falling through a fourth dimension? A plane orthogonal to the third three dimensions we know. Haphazard Adventure wrote, Adventure wrote Imagine a world that exists on a flat piece of paper. With a population of little two-dimensional beings that can only perceive and traverse the flat plane of the paper. Now if you, as a three-dimensional being, were to poke a hole through that paper, these beings would find an area of their world that, as far as their understanding of the fabric of reality allows, simply doesn't exist. Unless... You think back to that night you were always told about the stars being holes to Aetherius. If the night sky were a giant black ceiling like you thought when you were little, then a hole poked through it would just be a circle. But if someone cut a round hole in three-dimensional space, it wouldn't be a circle, it would be a sphere. A sphere-shaped hole directly in the fourth dimension. But of course, when you tried to slam your little magic line into the stars, it just bounced off the edges. This could mean the holes to a theory story is bullshit and you're overthinking a children's fairy tale. Or... It could just mean that the hole is closed off on its edges. Given that you can move your little magic line freely around the outside of the star, that really makes it less of a hole and more of a tube. And if the star is just a cross-section of a weird looking a weird tube leaning to multiple planes, maybe you could JJR wrote, Remember that book you panic flipped through? One of the pages was about creating a so-called standard magical star tesseract? Cheese wrote, Orient to the warrior head star, form the tesseract. Conjuration code 8068480098. Fuck, that's right, the book! Oh, there's a gif here. Hold on, I'll, I'll get it. Fuck, that's right, the book! But just before you went blind, you were looking at a magic book that mentioned otherworldly denizens, and there was a whole section in, the, in it talking about stars. Now, let's open that in a new window. Okay. You frantically try to recall details of what you saw. If your ridiculous and overcomplicated complicated idea about stars being tubes reaching through multiple planes of existence is right, you might be able to follow those tubes. If you knew roughly where the next step along a four-dimensional tube was going to be, following it might be as simple as like searching the correct spot in a three-dimensional space. You remember the book had an almost map-like diagram of some constellations with six stars labeled, and if you could remember what? The thought dwindles out before you feel a sudden silence in the air. Sigrid has stopped talking. Your brief reprieve to look for a magical solution is almost over. Moving fast, you, di you drive your magical line toward the nearest thing that looks sort of like a constellation from the book. You have no idea how reaching to another plane works, what this sort of magic is supposed to look like, or if you're even on the right track with your dumb idea about planes and tubes. To make matters worse, you probably have seconds left before your silence seems weird and Sigrid knows something is up. Take taking a deep breath, you close your already blind eyes, you try to concentrate on all six stars at once, and you reach...
credits. Caliber A.M. Kitsune. It's moving. One, two, three, four, five, six, six stars. Something is definitely happening in this picture. Oh. Oh, God. It's the code. VC Sajen wrote, Remember the conjuration code! It's 8064 8064-8004-8008. <laughs> Did she just... Did she just body snatch that skeleton? Kadi, a great friend. Cryjester wrote, did, did it work? Well, you're definitely seeing something, and unlike the vague magic shapes you've been sensing up until now, you're actually seeing something. You're just not sure what it is. Reaching your magic through the sky until you see skeletons should probably make you uneasy, but for some reason it just doesn't. In fact, you feel almost happy, like an old friend just came through the door and you want to give them a hug. You feel blessed that this friend chose to summon with Cairn Corp and are wondering how you can best serve them today. Voice wrote, Hello? Skeleton friend, can you hear us? You quietly ask the skeleton if it can hear you. What was that? What was that? Sigrid asks. While she speaks, you take note that you can hear yourself loud and clear, even in the noisy chapel of the Arts Auditorium, which is weird because you were never wondering if you could hear yourself, nor are you in an auditorium. If there's interference with the connection, you realize, you could always nullify the Tesseract and reestablish the ley line through a static mage tallow array? You don't know what any of these things mean or why you're thinking them. These aren't your thoughts. Can you repeat that? Sigrid asks again with the slightest note of frustration. I was, uh... Just wondering if you could hear me you say, pushing the intrusive thoughts to the back of your mind. You lie and tell Sigrid that you've been very quietly responding to all the stuff she's been saying for the last ten minutes, but it might have been too quiet for her to hear. You can feel the foreign thoughts wondering if you're still there, or if the liminal connection is degraded. Hold on, you think to yourself, struggling to untangle your own thoughts and senses from these new ones. David Hedrick wrote, Introduce yourself and ask them that being if they would help you. Well, all right, you think you've got this now. As an introduction, you think about, you think, quickly think about yourself. An amateur mage in a desperate situation, hoping to maybe reach out to some otherworldly help. You know, that's a lot of, uh, that, you know, that's a thing mages do, summoning animals and weapons from other worlds. Ideally, you prefer help from a neutral entity rather than some kind of evil demon god. You retroactively realize that might be offensive if the skeleton is an evil demon god. You think about how potentially sorry you are for that. Sigrid sighs. You hear the scoot of a chair and her magic form begins to move. I strive to be an accommodating person, Katia. I think everyone should do what they can to get along with others, and a big part of that is letting them take the lead so you can both discover where your shared interests lie. But let's be honest, friendship isn't your forte. In fact, sometimes it's like you don't want to connect with others. Right now, it feels almost like you're trying to waste my time for the crime of wanting you to like me. Luckily, the skeleton's positive feelings only grow stronger. It realizes you've connected to the perfect plane. Cairn Corp is a privately owned corporation providing a safe, approachable alternative to Daedric summoning. The glorious makers believe that conjuration doesn't have to be about whisking unexpected, unexpected beasts away from their home plane. It could be a friendly business, building strong customer relationships and offering exciting paid upgrade plans, summoning with a smile, not a scowl, we are willed to say. I don't think you're a bad person, Katia, but it hurts that you could come to hate me so quickly without even sharing how the feelings arose. But simply, I fear I may hurt someone else the same way I hurt you and want to know how to avoid it so I can better hold on to you and my other friends in the future. I want to be better, but it's like you don't care and just want to waste my time. And I think you know that you're just wasting time. Okay, you think. That's kind of creepy in several places, but probably the innocent kind of creepy. So if you're, if you're understanding right, whoever you're telepathically communicating with right now, they can help you? You concentrate on the fact that you're blinded and trapped in a room with an insane evil sorceress? Best case scenario, you'd like to tie her up and stuff her in a crate. Realistic case scenario, you'd like to get out of get out of here with most of your organs. Like, the important ones. It's kind of hard to follow two things at once, but you think you get the general idea and mutter something about how you just want other friends and that's okay. Do you really, Katia? Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're not exactly overwhelmed with people who care for you. You all but said as much when we first met, and were adorably head over heels when we clicked. Again, don't take this wrong, but you could probably spend the next week down here wasting my time with meandering stories, and nobody would go wondering where you disappeared to. 
There's an eerie slowness to the final bit, giving giving it clear emphasis. The skeleton considers Cairn Corp's many enticing options that you may find beneficial. For general protection, the makers and their benevolence offer several convenient models and of skeletal minions pre-equipped with armored weaponry in guaranteed optimal condition. If you're looking for mystic aid, you can hear a lot you can sign a liability waiver for access to the maker's holiest phantasms and ghasts. If your blindness is a pre-existing condition, Care Corp even offers the option to reassign any conjuration code to an acute and convenient seeing eye socket dog. No matter your need, Cairn Corp is excited exalted to provide. And, while I hate to think it, I worry sometimes that you could just disappear off the face of the world and you'd have no close friends to miss you. That's not a way anyone should live, Katya. I want to help you. But if I'm going to try to be your friend, you have to at least try to reciprocate. Perhaps care a little more about my interests and problems and less about yourself? That's good, you think, because things are kind of heating up and it looks like you might you need a hand right now. You express a quick concern that cluelessly consorting with otherworldly forces like this might make the situation worse, but the skeleton solemnly notes that Cairn Corp thrives on repeat businesses and word-of-mouth advertising. Conjuration should be an enjoyable and convenient experience, not an uphill battle to keep a ravenous beast under your control. The excellent customer service bound within us by righteous prayer is one of the many reasons the soul Cairn currently places in the top three Conjuration plans by user count. Another shuffle of fabric. A hollow click like something touching against a small bottle. Friendship isn't about me, it's about we! Everything you do, Katya, is always so focused on getting things from people, or improving your own standing. But you have to understand, these boons come on their own if you're simply nice to others and show an interest in their interests. And of everyone you could possibly practice on, my interest is simply making people like you as happy as possible. All you have to do is help me understand how you came to hate me so vehemently. Something you accidentally did manage to not instantly sour you to one of your best friends. Something about this still seems distressingly convenient. Like, if summoning perfectly subservient skeleton people were this easy, everyone would do it. There has to be some catch, but you're running out of time here, so whatever the horrible drawback is, you'll just have to deal with it later. You think you're ready, please send help or whatever they do. Look at where you are right now. Or should I say, look metaphorically with what what with you pulling Tavia's old invisibility cloak off like that. All your life you've been doing your things your way, thinking only of yourself and not the collective good of everyone around you. And look where it's gotten you, all alone, without a single friend to help you when you are in trouble. Excellent! Now you have an existing now do you have an existing account with us? Or do you need to fill out the registration paperwork? Maybe it's time we play things my way. Hurry slash stall. But speaking of stalling, I'm going to continue this in the next episode. Ha <laughs> ha! Segways! So, that being said, this has been Anashi Sasuke. This is episode 20-something of Let's Read Prequel. If you liked it, a like and a subscribe will be groovy. If you didn't, you don't need to do either one of those things. If you want to click the bell, you can do that as well so you're notified of future uploads. And I'll see y'all in the next one. Later!